This week, the Informer launches The Informed, which is a panel of experts across business, politics, law and industry who are going to give us their take on local, national and worldwide events. And today, on the inaugural Informed, we've got with us today John Heron, who is a solicitor and a victim's advocate. We've got Ingrid Maynard, who has had a lifetime in the small business field and is a founding member of the Victorians Party. And of course, Nina Farrow, a stalwart and icon in the entertainment industry. Good morning, all. Morning, Michael. Hi, Michael. Now, 2021 was meant to be the year that 2020 emerged from, and we were all hopeful. Nina, how are we feeling about 2022? What's the mood in the entertainment industry? Ooh, we, we are trepidatious. I mean, we want to believe that, you know, things will come back to uh, perhaps pre, pre-COVID uh, levels again, but so much has changed. These last two years have completely turned every industry on its head quite frankly but with the entertainment industry we've lost a lot of venues we're losing people out of the industry as well and they're diversifying going into other areas of employment and so you know it there are still there is still stuff going on but i think at the moment we're just putting one foot in front of the other with a with a vision to hopefully perhaps re recalibrate the industry as well. This gives us an opportunity to uh, put our foot forward in a way that we haven't been able to do before. So there's some positive aspects to this and we're all trying to stay really positive, but it has been quite traumatic. I think people are just still at the moment um, getting, just getting through the, the initial coming out of lockdowns into what has been, you know, it's the busiest, craziest time of the year and just managing with that. We're all the busiest we've ever been, but I think it's a bit of a false economy at the moment. We'll, um, we will have to see what happens. Now, Nina, for the entertainment industry, it was a bit of a double whammy because a lot of people in the arts would subsidise their sporadic employment in the hospitality industry, which was also decimated and yet trying to get some sort of industry or personal support from the government that was actually tailored to such a huge and important and transient now uh, group. Mm. How do you feel that that could have been handled better or what should we have learnt from the last response going forward? Should this happen again, do you think? Great point. It it was it was very slow in the in the coming around in terms of um, a help financial help for the entertainment sector which is absolutely as you said it's still a really important part of our economy it actually creates a lot of work and we 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 create a lot of revenue uh it was just very very slow and i and again i don't think people quite understand how entertainers work and even though even when we've come out of this and there's been uh gigs coming through it takes it doesn't just start up again we don't just open our doors like a cafe and start running you know we get booked well in advance and so the 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 winding up to things takes way more time than the government has allowed for and have really thought through so some of those processes could definitely be uh looked at and and changed again for the future like we're, we're just our, our biggest fear as as entertainers is getting locked down. Our ability to be able to do our job and earn a living uh, is is cut off at the knees. You know, only only some of us. I mean, a lot of us do teach as well, but not everyone teaches, and not everyone is set up in a way to be able to perform from home at the capacity which would actually be able to create income. So. Yeah, we're we're kind of left left out in the in the cold. Yet we're always the first ones called when there's a crisis, and they want us to, you know, give our time and effort to raise money for you know, very very important things like uh, the fire, the, you know, raising money for the, um, the bushfires and any kind of crisis. Really, we're always the first ones there. So getting something back from the government that's reciprocal in that way just going okay we see that you we see that you're struggling we want to maybe ask us a little bit more about how how it could be how the assistance could be given in a way that's um just just more more rel- relative to how we live and the way that we live you know now ingrid that's my side of things 
Ingrid, this, this plays right into the Victorians' party initial um, need for actually becoming a, a force was the lack of support for small business. Now, the entertainment industry is also a huge draw for the tourism industry when you see people coming to Melbourne for shows and all of the rest of it, and yet the Victorians party specifically aimed at the uh, disenfranchised and forgotten small business, which accounts for over 90% of the economy in Victoria. It's over 600,000 small businesses, which employ between zero and 19. A lot of them are out of, um, not so much design, but need. So there's a lot of uh, women that are in the workforce because it helps them in, in the small business, helps them care for the young ones. I know myself as a sole parent to my daughter, that was the main driver for me to be in business for myself because family-friendly workplaces in male-dominated areas aren't there. So, Ingrid, what would you like to see, or what do you think should have happened, and what would you like to see happening should the Victorians' party get in? Yeah, thanks for that, Michael. Um, yeah, I, I thought that, that everything that Nina just said was absolutely on point, and that's speaking from somebody who understands her industry, who's lived and breathed it for however long you, you've been in it, Nina, and, and it just was a resounding voice of experience there. And and what, why I was nodding so wildly was just, again, I think that, you know, the theme here that seems to, to emerge time and again, regardless of the industry, is the lack of consultation um, to industry, to people that know their industry, understand that there needs to be a measured response to, you know, a once in a 100 year um, occurrence. There's no doubt that, you know, no one came with that rule book. We all get that. However, um, there needs to be um, an appropriate response and a, and a measured response that's not going to decimate entire pockets of the fabric of our society. And when we think about, you know, the kind of society we want to live in, you know, the arts in particular, and that that cultural rich fabric, particularly in Melbourne, that we've come to, to really value and treasure as part of our landscape here, as part of our draw card. Once upon a time, it would have made us the most livable city in the world. Now, um, you know, we haven't even got the, the horse and carts, they've been abolished, never ever to return, you know, in our city, thanks to, you know, deals made by the Andrews government around this last a permanent pandemic legislation. And, um, you know, they're, they're just some of the examples. And my son's also in the entertainment industry. And, and when Nina said it doesn't just, you don't just press a button and it just cranks up, um, you know, I absolutely see that. Um, I see the, the months of, you know, struggling to kind of try to get rehearsals in where, where they can, try to, you know, get studio time uh, when they can, uh, along with all of the other artists, and then trying to get gigs booked in again to support, you know, a launch, for example. And, um, yep, he has got a second job in a small business. Um, and, you know, and that's obviously a, a big passion of ours in the Victorian Party is really looking after the people that have traditionally taken very little, like a, like artists take very little from the economy and contribute well above um, their, their belt weight. Uh, you know, they, they, they absolutely um, are the biggest employers, like you've just said, Michael, certainly um, come out of, you know, necessity and need, um, create it, it. For me, small business is a creative um, response to an economic situation. And um, when we think about our migrant population, they come here many of them with qualifications, unfortunately, that aren't recognised in this country. And what do they do? They create for their families and for themselves. And again, um, contribute to their, to their local communities, being more than just a, a business provider and a provider for their own families. They create jobs and opportunities and, and then, you know, that can interconnectedness. So when I think about <laughs> this year and next year, I am absolutely 100% behind Nina in that I would hate to see another lockdown. I would hate to see another lockdown in Victoria in particular because I think Victorians ha have been pushed way beyond uh, their limits. We've been the most locked down city in the world, Melbourne, um, and I think it's got to stop. I think that there needs to be consultation. Like, I'm in, I'm in sales. I've been in B2B sales forever. And one of my principles is to go to the market, 
understand what your clients value, what their number one or number two priorities are, and then provide a solution in consultation with them. And I think that that would be, you know, a, a really good foundation stone upon which to, you know, to start to set some new policy. Now, now, John, you've gone from a solicitor to a very staunch and very effective victims advocate, and now you're about to throw your hat in the political ring for this coming year, I hear. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, that's right, Michael. So I'm the endorsed Liberal Democrat candidate for the federal seat of McEwen. Um, that's from the political aspect. I don't know how that will pan out. It's a, it's a new journey for me. The journey I've been through in the last 12, 18 months, just in the legal field, it's probably, you, you best describe it as disruption, but maybe not for change. So probably a lot of the, the listeners may not be aware of a lot of the seismic shifts that happened um, in dealing with the law, courts, police, these types of things. I'll give you one example that when the pandemic um, occurred, for example, being a small town lawyer, I'm like a GP. So there was a lot of um, increase in domestic violence. A lot of that um, led into uh, increased um, family law proceedings, possibly doubling. I I've keep uh, um, my ear to the ground and, and discuss this with other lawyers. So this is a sad event. Um, as far as things with, with criminal activity, that's probably steady, but there's a lot of, a lot of these things are intertwined in, in what I see. Um, courts came to a complete stop initially, um, but they actually worked it out technically. So I'm sitting in my courtroom right now. So I have my clients in court with me and we um, we conduct court proceedings online and we have people in various locations. So that's actually been a good innovation. It took a few uh, weeks, if not months, for the courts to sort that out. For example, the first family law hearings, it was um, a, a conference telephone and there was 50 people online and I could hear Mandarin and was trying to pick out Russian and all types of different languages. But that was the chaos that people found themselves in. And, and people come to see me, all the courts, when they're at the end of the line. So it's a very emotional and critical um, development. Even things with the prison, the prison population um, was, uh, that's called the muster, that was full, but that's decreased with COVID. Um, with some of the uh, consequences of COVID, you can make of that what you want if you've got more individuals out like that, but probably focus the government more on recidivism, what to do to go into crime prevention. Um, another thing I was involved in from the legislative aspect was the gag, what we call the gag laws. That's working with Nina Fennell, um, Jamie Lee Page and, um, and Grace Tame. We're in the Victoria, we had a situation where victims and survivors of sexual assault had to apply to a court, otherwise they could be fined if not jailed. So just as a reminder, in, in October last year, that was um, quite a, uh, a political event. There was a lot of, um, a, a lot of negotiating and influencing the crossbench, believe it or not, the current pandemic legislation, as Ingrid mentioned, were able to have that overturned. And it was the first time in Victoria that there was a defeat in the upper house. I've seen around that period where, like the Victorian government now, when they want to ran through legislation, they generate what's called an omnibus bill, about so thick, and they slide in all types of other legislation and limit debate, etc. So there's been and a, a virtual assault on democracy in Victoria. One of the reasons that, that I throw my hat in the ring is that I think it's time for people, good people with experience, not that I'm necessary in that, but there are a lot of other good people out there, I think, that are contemplating and will run. And it's about time that we had these types of people to fully represent us, not entering politics just for their own career. So that's a bit of a mouthful, Michael. You can take out what you think from that. Now, that... that Oh, sorry, Michael. I just want to say to John, you know, we need more people like you. That's what we need. We need less of these experienced career politicians and people that have done the hard yards in the community who understand, who are living the experience every day and advocating on behalf of clients like you, you've got there, John. That's that we need more people like exactly like you. One hundred percent. Now. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to jump a little bit here where um, one of the things that's come through on everyone's answer 
is the lack of consultation that governments have taken and the lack of consideration. So while they may have been able to find a way where they could legally or administratively do what they did, I don't think that they've had anyone sitting there looking at the moral and ethical repercussions of it. We can do it, but should we do it? Just because you can, you should. When we saw, uh, while we're seeing now, the St Basil's, those 50 deaths and uh, the family members that are there, um, not able to even go to the funeral and collectively mourn and you know, the things where the Victorian Ombudsman, Deborah Glass, said that Andrew's border lock, lockout was inhumane, where she said it was the worst uh, decision she'd seen in her seven years in the top job, and it was more about finding a way to keep people out than finding a safe way to bring them back. This is, I feel, where politics has gone off the track, and I think a lot of it is driven by that need to seem... Uh, strong and decisive and uh, never failing, rather than actually seeking to consult and compromise. What do you think, Dana? I would really love to see more compassion and empathy in politics, because I don't think that's a weakness. I think um, being able to consider those those decisions in that way with just that little bit more compassion and empathy. I, I, I understand that, you know, laws need to be made and, and rules need to be set, otherwise anarchy and chaos, but there's got to be a way of being able to create uh, better, better systems to incorporate that humane empathy that we're just, that was a bit, that was missing. I, I feel like everyone was coming from a place of panic and, and not really considering you know the um, the toll that it's taking on people. I've I've had um, I've got very good friends who through the lockdowns lost husbands, and you know took three months to be able to to um, finally re you know lay them to rest. Um, my for example, my family we're going through a health crisis at the moment with my stepfather, and you know my mother's only allowed to go in and see him for an hour a day, and they had to fight for that too um, on compassionate grounds. It's um, there just needs to be a little bit of just that, yeah, someone needs to have a good think about if it was them and how they would be feeling and find that compassion and empathy. I think there's, there's it's time to add that to political uh, dealings and that, political considerations. That That's one of the things that struck me. We found ways to um, mitigate uh, the risks of the races of uh, interstate travel, of... Uh, borders reopening, but we couldn't find a way or go to the trouble to mitigate people going to funerals. Like mm, yeah. that's, you know, if we couldn't get in rapid antigen testing or PCR 72 hours before and give people the option, um, what do you think, Ingrid? Uh, yeah, no, uh, again, I, I just think that um, this whole pandemic's been a, a Trojan horse for. Um, for, for putting for 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 chain for trying to and I don't think they've they've succeeded but tr for trying to um, use fear based politics to control a population and um, in many different ways you know in lots of different ways um, and by separating people um, from from one another you know families you know I a friend of mine's father she managed to be there but her mother couldn't be there was only one at a time and. I just think, you know, about a, a friend who's in hospital at the moment, mental health issues, no visitors allowed. Um, isn't that the time that when we need connection the most? Um, isn't that the opposite to addiction? Um, no compassion and empathy Nina was talking about there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the, the politicians that we have in place, um, particularly in, in Victoria, and that's obviously my home state, so that's what I'm going to be, you know, focused on because that's where I felt it the most, has been anything but compassionate. There has almost been a delight in keeping people away from each other, in in uh, removing people's freedoms, removing people's abilities to think for themselves. There has been inconsistencies around legislation and rules or mandates. 
and um, and it's been not only confusing, but it's also created um, a whole society, even when you remove masks, where people are still driving around because they're terrified of being locked up again. Um, so they'll drive in their own cars wearing a mask or, you know, and they're usually elderly people. And I just think that that's, that's just one of the leg one of the many legacies of, of a lack of compassion and em empathy coming into decision making. Mm. Now, John, as a solicitor and a, a victim's advocate, you would have seen this time and time again where the government says, right, we're going to enact this law, legislation is in, jobs done over and over and out, and they haven't considered the unintended consequences that happen. So if we, you know, if we're going to lock this person up. Uh, what's going to happen to their family if we're going to throw this man out of his home? Where does where does he go to stop the uh, uh, violence? Uh, and he ends up coming back and breaching orders because it's just a piece of paper. They, you know, it's it's one of the most um, high risk times for a woman is immediately after an uh, intervention order has been applied. Yet the government seems to go right. We've got that. We've stopped it and they don't look at the flow on effects or continue it down to you know the the final outcome is that correct would you say that's yeah in, indeed and look there are i'll give you an example of my local member that during the pandemic um, she issued like 1800 numbers for women in crisis to call now my experience is that generally they're not um, they're not attended to during the day so you can't even get through can't get through to the women's legal service and then she put out on, on the local paper, men about to perpetrate family violence should call this 1-800 number. Okay, so uh, <laughs> women were incredulous at that. That's the sort of response. Part of that too is that the government the last four years, particularly in Victoria, when you've got this rampant, I'll be frank, cronyism. So you get below average people being slotted into these, in, particularly in the justice field, but all across the board in government, the arts included, that, that are within the government. They're not up to the task. Throw in a pandemic and then they're not just struggling, they're going under for the third time. So government is also, uh, like any organisation, it's actually a, a management people issue. If you have poor people and poor management, the result is what we've got now. So for example, with all of the lockdown rules and the one trick pony type response from the government, lockdowns and curfews, etc., cetera, if, if you're not up to say building a bridge, all you have to do is look at how someone else built the bridge. So it's very, very easy to, um, Ingrid mentioned, and you mentioned as well, like uh, rat testing, et cetera, as a, as a quick solution. I have friends in, um, my in-laws reside in Ireland. That's, that's, uh, I was talking to them last night. Um, my son's cousin had a positive case in the, in the class, quick rat test, no, um, no positive result back at school. Now, as you mentioned, John, one of my pet peeves is the cronyism that happens in government. We've seen people hauled before uh, integrity hearings, whether it be IBAC or ICAC, constantly, I can't recall, I can't recall, and next minute they're an ambassador somewhere in a plush posting because they've towed the, the uh, company line type thing. I would actually love to see a system similar to the American one where we need 75 or 80 per cent of Parliament to actually agree on any nomination for any, whether it be the Chief of Police, the Chief Health Officer, any anyone in a top public servant role where they've got to do it so that instead of getting where we are now, we've become so divided, where it's the pendulum swinging wildly from side to side, where they're putting in people that are so partisan that they will do their bidding. I would love to see that bring it back to the middle where they've got a compromise. You know, he mightn't be the most conservative, but he's not not the most uh, liberal or progressive and have that. But, you know, even the information officer, uh, what was he, Slim Blumel, has said that he's shocked and he can't get anything done about the FOI uh, problem in Victoria. Because for the government to go, no, you can't have it, well, hang on, they work for us. So... 100%. I think that's the bit that's been missing here is transparency of government and accountability. I, I don't know in any other industry where I don't know, I can't recall um, having 800 workplace deaths on your hands um, and ineffective policy and, and outcomes 
um, a, a deficit like we've inherited, um, you know, the, the economy will not just bounce back. And I love Josh, Josh Frydenberg's um, <laughs> optimism, um, but he's looking at the whole country um, and that would be buoyed pri prim primarily through WA and um, and the fact that they've kind of kept trading South Australia to a, to a lesser extent, Queensland, but gee, you know, if we if we look at the performance of this government, um, you know, I really I would really love to see not only what you've just suggested around you know those voting of, of people you know right people for the right jobs, but also um, performance. You know, if if you if you go to if if you're trying to get a, elected in any kind of role based on a, you know a, a promise based on what you're saying your KPIs are going to be, and then you don't deliver on those, and you and there's a fair reason for, you know, there's no fair reason why. Why not? See you later. All right. Because that's life. Yep. <laughs> now, we're just going to quickly wind up. We've only got a couple of minutes left on our inaugural The Informed, and I think it's gone uh, really well. It's been a fascinating conversation. Let's finish with something positive. Some of the uh, good things out of the pandemic. For me, it was... Um, the realisation, hopefully going forward, that our daily, what we saw as our temporary insecurity and discombobulation is some people's daily reality. And hopefully, I'm hoping we go forward with a little bit more compassion that this is some people's, we've had a glimpse into some people's daily uh, reality and we carry that forward. What about you, Nina? What would you like to see going forward into 2022? Uh, I, I love what you've just said and I, I want to extend on that because for me these last two years have helped me and I can only speak for me personally what is really in, what's really important in my life and people <laughs> people are important everything else you can manage but if you don't have people around you if you're not able to give and receive support and being in support of one another life just doesn't actually function and move on. I would not have gotten through the last 21 months or however long it's been without the support and love and consistency of um, the people around me. So the me that the mental health thing for me is, is a big one. I really want them to, I really wish for our governments and the people that are coming into power to really consider that that has to be on the top of the list. Because if you do that, everything underneath it will actually work as well as they want it to work it's not going to if people are um just beside themselves with worry and grief and not being able to connect so connection i got things have gotten simpler um and in a, in a good way for me i'm i'm looking forward to 2022 for that reason um everything else I, i'm not quite sure of and i don't i don't like to kind of think negatively i always want to think positively um and yes we've got a bit of a climb ahead but um I stay buoyant and buoyed by the love and the support of the people around me and uh, and things like this. Great. So thank you. And Ingrid, apart from the Victorians party being swept to power, what about for you? Oh. Uh, look, I, um, gee, you know, I, I, I just, I, th I think Nina just said it beautifully. I don't know if I have a lot to add to, to that because I think that everything comes back down to connection and relationships and um, the importance of, of family, um, the importance of being able to see family, the importance of inclusion and uh, non-discrimination um, across the board, across any kind of discrimination. I think we, we need to understand that uh, it's not just the big ticket things, the things that get, you know, um, the popular vote, but also the everyday um, inclusions and um, so that we, we bring everyone along together. Fantastic. And John, for you, apart from being the new federal men member for McEwen? One of, one of the really good things I've noticed living regionally is it's it's how, how would I turn this? Think local, act local. It's been really, there's been a much stronger sense of community here out in, in the regions. Um, a lot of people like myself now, like we're all working locally or from home etc. We've got an absolute flood of people from Melbourne snapping up um, <laughs> properties everywhere, yeah. uh, every, talking to real estate agents, not every second, but almost everyone is, is buying houses in the Macedon Ranges from the city. I was there on the probably, weekend, John. That's right. So that, that's a good thing. So we've got a really stronger sense of community. 
everyone like shops locally, etc. Probably not great for the metro area, but um, people from the metro are re realising it's the good life here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Nina, Ingrid, John, thanks so much for your time on the inaugural thanks, Informed, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Michael. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Meet you, Nick. Great to meet you too, John. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Lovely. Thanks. Lovely to meet you. <laughs>